worth noting is that Premiere Pro is a pro tool. It's a professional video editing tool. In fact, it's the professional video editing tool for the film and television industry. It's the same tool that Channel 9 use to put their news stories together every every day, every night. It's the same video editing package that many Marvel films have used to cut together their Marvel blockbuster films that we watch on Netflix and go to the cinema to enjoy. It's it's the industry standard for the television industry. It's the industry standard for the video production industry. But I wouldn't say just yet that it's fully the industry standard for the film industry. There's another product by another company called Avid, and they pretty much hold most of the film industry still and, and continue to make business from the film industry. But Premiere Pro is fast um, going into that world as well. So the reason why I'm letting you know that background is that when your students are using Premiere Pro and learning the basics of it, they're actually getting themselves ready for industry because it has continued to be the professional tool to use. And in saying that, it can get pretty intimidating and pretty complicated right from when you first opened it up. It can look pretty scary because it is a professional tool. And we don't apologize for that. But what we have done is we have dumbed it right down and created another product called Premiere Rush. And hopefully you've already experienced Premiere Rush and got a sense for it, because if you find that this session that we're about to do together now just is just too complicated and, and it's way beyond you, then you've always got Premiere Rush to work with, which is a far more superior product than, Premier, than iMovie in the sense that you can use it for a start on a Windows machine and a Mac. So it's, it's compatible across the board. It's also an iOS tool and an Android tool as well. And it's, it's got an app for your iPhone and for your Android device. It uses the built-in camera. You can do all the editing within Premiere Rush. It's a wonderful solution. And Abigail, you might want to find the Premiere Rush sessions that we've done in the past with South Australia Department for Education and then put a link in the chat to those sessions because we've done a number of sessions on Premiere Rush in the yes. past. Yes, yep, I can do that right yeah. now. And that becomes like a fail safe for you if you find Premiere Pro too, too challenging. In saying that though, it's, oh, the other reason why it's better than iMovie is that you, you're working with multiple layers of video and multiple layers of audio. In iMovie, you're really just emulating layers. You've got one layer of video, one layer of audio, and then you can add things to it, but you don't get a lot of control over what's going on in those layers. With Premiere Pro, you've got up to 96 layers of video you can work with and 96 layers of, of, of audio. No one uses 96 layers. Not even Marvel Studios use 96 layers to make their blockbuster films. But it is there for you. And I've seen student productions that are using up to 18 or 19 layers. I've seen primary school students using up to 16 or 17 layers in their productions in Premiere Pro. So I certainly don't want to say that Premiere Pro is just for high-end secondary and university and, and industry because primary school students are, are loving it and doing some things. In fact, right from the start, is I want to show you a this clip. I want to sh not this one, that one a little bit later. I want to show you this. This was made by a group of primary school students that only yesterday I got permission from their parents to make it public. So I've just put it, which shows off this film, uh, plus another film that was made by some secondary students in um, New Zealand. Now, obviously, there was some, a, a teacher and parents who knew about Premiere Pro to help them with this, uh, but the whole thing was put together with Premiere Pro and they did a, a fantastic job. The power I'm scrolling and all the bad news going on about flooding, bushfires, tornadoes and earthquakes and all the bad news about climate disasters. It's easy to feel a bit sad, powerless and angry. What am I supposed to do about this? Or this? Or this? It's the end of the world! I just feel really, really scared. I feel like I can't really do anything about it. Because I'm just a kid and I'm not the one in power. By the time we're all grown up, it could be too late. So what can you do? Just do something. Don't underestimate the power of five. Step one. 
Pick something you care about. Make sure it's fun. Turn, Turn it into, into a game. game. Today we're picking up rubbish out of the river because it's bad for the environment. Step two. Bring your friends. If you bring five friends, you change how they behave. If one person influences five, that's awesome. And now you've got 25 people doing something new. And then How cool is that? It's such a cool film and, and obviously it's a lovely story. It's a great message. And the thing that I love about Premiere Pro is that you're pretty unlimited in terms of what you can do with it. And that's why it's a professional tool. So let's, um, let's just show you why it's a professional tool. And I'm going to go back to this clip here. And what you're about to hear is some Hollywood directors and editors who have basically telling you why they chose Premiere Pro for their editing of their productions. Every time when we work on a project, we try to do something new and exciting. One of the reasons why we choose Adobe products is that it gives us more flexibility in what we're trying to achieve. As a feature editor, you always want things to be changing and improving. We want to be comfortable with the tools with which we work. What we need in an editing package is really an uninterrupted flow between the idea and the output. Tim Miller. And so he was the director of the first Deadpool film. And when I when I work with teenage boys, usually I'll just say, well, this is the same software that was used to make Deadpool. And suddenly you've got them. Like, oh my goodness, it's my favorite film and, and so on. When I work with girls, I um, in a girls' school just recently, I was showing them clips from Billie Eilish and the fact that she uses Premiere Pro for all of her videos. And she's been learning Premiere Pro since she was about 16 years old, which was only four years ago for, for Billie Eilish. She's literally only turned 20 last December. So, and she's been using Photoshop since she was 13 and instantly the girls are engaged and want to know more about it. I uh, try not to show the Billie Eilish material to the boys because that turns them off straight away. I'm being a bit facetious there, but um, it is used at the highest level and that's, uh, there's lots of clips out there on YouTube you can show your students about how that's all happening. So let's mm -hmm. jump into a few basics. It's not about the tool as such, even though we're here to learn about the tool, it's about the story. And if it boils down to it that you're going to use iMovie in the end, I mean, really, it doesn't really matter. I know I shouldn't be saying that because I'm working for Adobe, I'm pushing the Adobe tools. Um, but I love iMovie. That's how I started as an editor. I used iMovie. Well, that's not how I started. I actually started was by splicing film. My father had a Super 8 camera uh, when I was a kid. And he'd, he'd just be filming constantly when we go overseas and do all sorts of things. And then we had a splicing machine. And that's how I learned how to edit with him, literally cutting the film and splicing it all together to make a story. And then what we'd do is we'd send that film that he'd spliced, we'd send it off to Sydney to get a soundtrack put on it. And a month later, it would come back in the post, although once it didn't, and we lost all this family footage which we'll never ever get back because it got lost in the mail at some point. But um, it would come back a month later with a soundtrack and then we'd have all sorts of fun with a microphone that we'd plug into the splicing machine and do our sound effects. And we'd have two audio layers left and right. And so if he, if he was filming a waterfall in New Zealand, he would go and flush the toilet next to the, with the microphone and get the sound of the, of the water and that would be the sound for the waterfall. He was so clever. And, and I was learning lots in the process, and that's how I developed a real passion for telling stories with film. These days, it's so much easier. And even if you've just got a phone, you can film and edit and do it all with Premiere Rush or iMovie or whatever you want to use. But Premiere Pro gives you so many more options. And the first thing I always encourage students and teachers when I'm teaching video editing is to start thinking about your your folder structure right from the start. It's a lot to do with file management right from the start, although it's getting easier now. With Premiere Rush, you don't have to worry too much about, about it. And even with Premiere Pro now, we're making it a bit easier. But I highly recommend that you always have a project folder. You name that project folder something that relates to the story that you're telling. And in every project folder, you have a footage subfolder, a still subfolder, and an audio subfolder. 
so that when you're building a project, you're, everything's stored in the one folder together. It, it makes things so much easier for everyone later on. Now, we've got a great range of tutorials because we're only going to scratch the surface on what's possible today with Premiere Pro, and you're going to realise there's so much more you can learn and do. Uh, so I want to point you to these tutorials so that you can work out where to go. The simplest way to get to these, I'll, I'll first of all, I'll put that link into the chat so that you've got access to them straight away. But the other thing to notice is that when you open up Premiere Pro and virtually any Adobe product these days, you will have a learn button. And when you look for that learn button, that's another way of learning the tool while you're in the tool. So if I click on the learn button in Premiere Pro, it's taking me to these same tutorials. It may not be in the same order that uh, in the browser version, but you can see this one is a four minute tutorial open, uh, what is it, animation basics, add speed ramps to create dynamic movement. Lots of different things as we scroll through, usually they start with introductory type tutorials and then lead into more advanced things. And it's a, it's a wonderful way to learn the tool. And what I'm finding is a lot of teachers are now, particularly media teachers, are relying on these tutorials to do the teaching because they're not necessarily experts in the software themselves. They're experts in how to tell a story, but not necessarily in how to use Premiere Pro. So the, the tutorials teach the tool and they do that outside of class time in like a flipped learning approach. So the students do all of that learning in their own time. And then when it comes to being in class with the teacher, you can focus on the storytelling. You can focus on working with the kids that need the extra support and collaborating and being more creative rather than just spending so much time learning the tool. So that's what I advise you to do if you wanna get into this a bit more seriously is look for that learn button. I'm gonna start uh, by clicking new project. And obviously that's going to start creating a new project with Premiere Pro. And I recommend you do the same with me if you've got Premiere Pro open. Excuse me while I just refix my microphone here, my headphones, sorry. Um, there's a new way now uh, in the latest version of Premiere Pro, which uh, I think this, this new version came out at the start of this year. So if you have got a relatively recent version of Premiere Pro, you'll notice the beginning of a project is a little bit more like Premiere Rush than it has been before because um, it's starting to encourage you to go into your hard drive, just like Premiere Rush does, to your desktop, your documents, to find your files and then select them and then it'll bring them all into a project for you, which is great, uh, but it's kind of cheating as well. So what I'd recommend you do is you have a project folder, like I said before, and then go and find that project folder and then find and then start clicking all the resources that you want to work with in that project folder and then click create down the bottom right hand corner and it'll start building your story for you just like it does with Premiere Rush. This is a relatively new thing because if you've got a slightly older version of Premiere Pro, you didn't have any of this. You'd have to start from scratch, open up a new project, go and work out where your folder is. So we're going to go through both because some of you may not have the latest version of Premiere Pro. So I want to kind of show you how to do both. Can I suggest if you've got Premiere Pro open, you should have this section, if it's a relatively new version, a section here called sample media. And that's where I've gone. That could be like a project folder. And in that sample media, there'll be a bunch of bunch of footage here and of some, I can't remember exactly where it's all located. It's just a whole lot of footage basically that we can all share together and work on the same story. So I'm just selecting a range of them. I'm not gonna select all of them. And I'm going to go down to where it says create. And what happens now when you click create is uh, and probably what I should have done before that is is chosen exactly where I want to save the project in advance. Uh, and that would have happened up the top. But what's happened now, it's brought in all of that footage into the timeline straight away. And it's a nice way of getting started when you've got the latest version. It does a lot of extra steps for you that you don't have to worry about. Um, before you get to this stage. Let's assume that you've got the older version, of, and I'm having awful trouble with my headphones here. I do apologize. I'm just going to reposition them because they're trying to come out of my ear. That should be better. Uh, 
I'm going to show you the the old way of doing it because I'm assuming that some of you have got the old version of Premiere Premiere Pro 2. And so when you do it the old way, you're creating a new project, but you won't have your local drive straight away for you. You will have an option to save your and give it a name. So I'm going to call it, uh, I'll call it test two. That'll be the name of my project. You'll have a location, probably your project folder that you've already created with all of your assets that are in there. So I'm going to choose a project folder that I've already got available uh, on my desktop. which has some footage in it. So I've got some still images, I've got some footage and I've got some audio files all in there and I'll click choose. And then when I click create, and I'm just trying to remember because I've been using the new version now for, for so long, I'm, I'm forgetting what the old version was like, but basically you had to do all of that and then click create. But once you were in, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get all your footage on your timeline, you'd get a, a blank section, your timeline wouldn't actually be there. What you'd need to do now is manually import all of your footage and your audio by going down to this section here. So before I do that, I'd like to just show you around the Premiere Pro environment and just give you a sense of what it what it's like, because it does look a bit intimidating, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty easy to work with. The Premiere Pro environment is made up of one, two, three, four, five, six main sections and then a bunch of um, headings. This is the old the old version, which is probably what you've got. Uh, the new version is slightly different, but still very similar. So down the bottom where it says media assets is where you manage all of your assets, all your footage and your stills and your, your moving images and your audio files. They go into folders and we don't call them folders in Premiere Pro, we actually call them bins after the old Hollywood term. The footage is in the can. It hasn't been processed yet, it's in the bin ready to be processed. The source monitor, monitor is where you can preview your footage or your audio, and you can set up in points and out points so that when you drag them from your source monitor to your timeline, you're only dragging the parts that you want to bring into your footage. So you don't bring the whole bit of footage and then cut them. A lot of people do that. They bring in all the footage into their timeline and they grab the razor blade and they start cutting and moving things out. That's not how you do it. That's not how professional video editors work. So I'm going to show you how to do it properly. And once it's in the timeline and you hit the play button, you'll get a preview in the program monitor up here. There's a play button that allows you to play forward and backwards. You can use the space bar to go forwards and backwards as well. In between these two windows is a set of tools of which the selection tool is the one you'll use most, but there is a cutting tool and there's a pen tool, there's a, a title tool, there's a range of tools that uh, we'll have a look at as well. And then on the far right hand side next to the timeline is the audio meter. And we'll talk about what is optimal audio levels, but you can see all your levels and you can see whether you're peaking into the red too much or if you're too soft, and that'll, uh, that'll be maintained as you're doing your editing. So that's the basic environment. When you're importing your media, you're looking for that bottom left-hand corner window, import media to start. You're doing a right click, and then you're looking for the import button, and that's how you can bring your media in ready to start editing. So I'm gonna do that, that process now. I'm doing a right click, I'm going to import, and on a Mac, which I'm using a Mac, it's it's quite a simple process. It's just a matter of selecting all of your folders, your still images, your footage, and your audio that you've already pre-organized in your project folder, and then clicking import. If you're on a Windows machine, it's best to do this one at a time. Select one folder, and there'll be a button on a Windows machine just around here somewhere that says import folder. And you click on that, and then that whole folder will go in as a bin. On a Mac, uh, you can just do them all at once, but on a Windows machine, I highly recommend you do them one at a time. So I'm going to pretend that I'm in a Windows machine because most of you probably are, and I'm going to hit that one folder and then pretend I've got an import folder button there, which is the same as my import folder, and it'll appear in a large icon view. So all my still images are sitting there ready to for me to access. I'm going to do exactly the same again. Right click import and find my footage folder. and import that folder. But of course, if you're on a Mac, you can just select all your folders and they'll all go in one at a time. What I don't recommend you do 
is go into the folder and select individual files. Try to select bring in folders rather than individual files when you're starting. So now what I've got is I've got a folder of still images, a folder of footage and a folder of audio. But because I previously started this with that uh, footage that everyone's got, then that's already sitting in my timeline. And what I generally do is um, when I've got footage that I wanted to bring in, let's say I'll open up my footage folder, I can, I can see what it looks like. If I double click the footage, I'll get a preview of it. And this little playhead here will allow me to scrub forward and backwards. And even if I just go to the preview of it, I can do the same down here just to get a sense of what the footage actually is, because I may have forgotten, I may not have labelled it properly, and I don't really know what the footage is. So it's good to get a preview of what it is all about. So I'm just going to grab this first bit of footage here. This is my daughter a few years ago. She's doing a little piece. To me. She starts here. You should hear me say action. Action. According to the World Health Organization, most healthcare associated infections. And of course, I filmed this making sure there was a microphone right near her, because whenever you're filming, and I'm, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about filming, but if you haven't got good quality audio and good quality footage, yeah, it's not really worth using. It's okay to have bad quality footage because we're used to that. We see that all the time in YouTube clips on the news when it's just a bit of footage from a security camera or something. We're okay with that. But if it's bad audio, oh, we just don't tolerate bad audio. So always try when you're filming to make sure that your microphone is close to your mouth. Now, one of the tricks that I show with kids, often in a school situation, you don't have an external microphone. Like I've got here a little wireless lapel microphone. Not many schools have got that. Uh, you might have a wired lapel microphone or the student might be able to hold a, a microphone. That's fine. Even if it's a $20 microphone, that's better than relying on the onboard microphone that's on your camera that might be two metres away from the, from the talent. That's going to allow a lot of room for mistakes and a lot of room for lots of other noise to come into the microphone. So avoid having distance between the microphone and the talent. Keep it nice and close. So a way of, of doing that, if you want to film with your camera uh, from a distance away, that's fine, but have a second device close to the person, maybe in their pocket, and record all their audio on that second device as well. So you've got a recording with two different devices. One, one's an iPad maybe that's filming uh, with the footage, and the other is like an iPhone that's recording all the audio. It can be a recording on iMovie if you like. It can be a recording on Rush if you like. It can be a recording on just an audio editor, as long as the microphone is close to the mouth. In fact, I've even seen a number of school films these days where they treat the phone as a microphone, and they're literally holding it up and then pointing it at and doing interviews with this, because it is, it's a microphone. And that's great. There's one little trick though, when you are filming with multiple devices, that it's important to go through a process of saying uh, the director who is who is ever controlling the scene says roll tape which is an old-fashioned word for just turn the record button on so we're now recording we're recording on our audio device we're recording on our video device give it a couple of seconds to make sure it's actually recording confirm with the camera operator that it is recording because sometimes they forget sometimes they don't hit the right button and then uh, what the director or someone will do is just do something like this and usually it's a clapperboard in, 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 in the professional mode, so I'll do that clap. And they do that because it sets up a little peak in your audio that you can then match later on with your various layers in Premiere Pro. So you match your video peak and your audio peak, make sure they're aligned together, and then everything will be in sync. Now, there's ways in Premiere Pro for you to automate all of that too, but I'm not going to go that technical for you. But uh, it's great to do that. And then once you've done the clap, then the director will say, action. And so then the talent knows to talk. And the reason why a director says action is not just for the talent to start acting or talking. It's also for the editor to set the in point. And that's what we know. That in point is going to be the beginning of the edit. So on this particular bit of here, I've got some color bars here. So I can just talk about it. action. According and as soon as I've said action, I'm going to create an in point. Action. And right at this point now where I've stopped the footage, I've heard myself say action, and I'm going to 
start the in point. Now I could click on this little button here that says mark in, or notice the shortcut next to mark in. It's just the eye on the keyboard. If I click the eye on the keyboard, I've now set up an in point. And then she's going to talk. According to the World Health Organization, most healthcare associated infections are preventable through good hand hygiene. And I'm going to stop there. That's where I wanted to stop. That's going to be my complete first edit. So if I is in, who in the chat is going to tell me what the output shortcut will be on the keyboard? Who's going to be the first one to give it to me? Well done, Gemma. <laughs> so I'll go O on the keyboard and now I've got my out point. And this is how professional editors work. They do this hundreds of times, thousands of times a day, every day. They go in, out, and then the third part is to drag and drag that footage into the timeline. Now I do already have footage in here, so I'm going to bring in my daughter at the end of whatever I've got here, uh, just, for, just for the sake of it. So here's the dragging process. Click anywhere on that on that monitor and drag it down. You can see it becomes a little edit. It becomes a little piece that's now snapping into position, or I could have it separate on its own, but it's kind of got a nice little snapping feel to it, so I know it's going to align itself. So when I start playing, according to it's, it's going from that bit of footage to her. Now, I'll fix up the resolution in a minute. I'll show you a quick shortcut for that. But that is the process of editing. And once you've shown your students how to do in, out, drag, the sky is the limit. Away they go. They just find more footage. And let's just uh, find something. You might find a still image now. Let's go take it back to my stills folder. Find a nice still image. So we've got her talking here. According to the World Health Organization, most healthcare associated infections are preventable through good hand hygiene. So as soon as she says good hand hygiene, I want to bring in um, maybe this picture here, this still image. And now I don't have to do an in and out because it's just a still image and it only goes for four seconds. So it's going to drag the whole thing at exactly the point in time. And I'm going to zoom right in. I'm going to use this little slidey tool down here that makes me slide left and right on my timeline. I'm going to grab the little handle at the end of the slidey tool and just zoom right in so I can get a lot of detail here. So she said, according to the World Health Organization, most healthcare associated infections are preventable through good. Now, as soon as she says good, that's when I want this to appear. And you can see that's why you have different layers. So she's still talking through good hand, but the picture appears and superimposes itself over the top of her. And that's the basics. That's the basics of working with Premiere Pro. In, out, drag, in, out, drag, and just working with your layers. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle, little piece at a time until you've told your story. Now, I know there's a bit of complication in there, but once you get the hang of importing and just being able to identify what you want in there and then getting the hang of in, out, and drag, it's not that hard. And it becomes a relatively simple process to work with. So before I go any further, um, I might just pause and see if there's any questions from anyone or if you want me to go over anything again, keeping in mind that we are recording this session so we, you can always look back on anything that I've just shown you. Sometimes when I get to this stage of the workshop, um, I can usually tell that um, most of the people that I'm working with are going to go back to Rush or iMovie because I've scared them. And that's that's fine. I mean, it is, it is a bit scary uh, in that sense. And when I first started using this, I, I felt the same as well. But I persisted and I love it now. It is definitely my favourite Adobe application because I'm working with moving images, still images, audio files, special effects, and I can create almost anything that comes to my imagination. And that's what I love about it. Janet's saying, does it matter which layer is the top one? Only in the sense that just like in Photoshop and Illustrator, whatever's on top is what you'll see. And you can always make it smaller and, and reduce the size of it and so on. But the, the, it, it does matter in the sense that um, if I had that in a layer underneath, for instance, if I move that one up there, I'm only seeing my daughter and I'm not seeing the picture. So if you want people to see it, it's got to be on a layer above. Gem is saying, sorry, Tim, I've been asked to fix something here, so I have to log off a bit. I hope 
So, okay, no worries. At least we're recording this. Okay, so let me show you the quick shot. Notice that I've got different resolutions. So obviously this bit of footage that uh, we've got here of Central America, it looks like, that's, um, that's I think that's in 720, so it's not in full high def, where this bit of footage is in full high def. And so I've got a, bit of a, a con conflict in terms of my resolutions. So whenever you've got that, and not, this often happens when you bring in a still image that you've taken with a DSLR camera, you'll find that it's just blown out of proportion. But it's really simple to fix. You just do a right click in the timeline of the of the footage that's got the issue and look for a button in your many buttons that you've got when you do a right click. Look for the one that says scale to frame size or the one below that set to frame size. Both of those will do the same job. And as soon as you find that button and click on it, then it doesn't matter what you've got, it'll just fit itself into the correct resolution for you. So you don't have to manually go in and change the scaling of it. It'll do it for you automatically. So now, according to the World Health Organization, that's looking a lot better. And I'm going to do the same with this still image here. I'm going to do a right click right in that little element that's representing that bit of footage on the timeline and going through all my options here and looking for this one that says scale to frame size. And now that picture's coming in. But now I've got a problem because the picture is coming in, but I can also see the background of my daughter because this picture wasn't made in 16 by nine. That's not a problem. I can just double click it in the preview monitor up here in the source monitor, in the program monitor. And I can just make it bigger if I wanted to, to fill the screen, or I can make it smaller and just move it to the right, and now I've got a picture-in-picture picture effect. So she's talking, through good hand and the picture appears. And because you've got 96 layers, you can have a picture-in-picture-in-picture-in-picture-in-picture. Picture picture picture. And if any of you are around my age, this is the Brady Bunch effect. Some of you might know exactly what I'm talking about. But there seems to be more and more teachers I'm working with these days who have no idea what I've just talked about. That's fine, not a problem. So Very good hand. that's the general idea. You just position, make sure the resolution's right, and then you can manually just grab those little handles as you select the different object, move things around with your mouse and scale them accordingly. Now I'm going to pause at this point to see if there's any questions or even feel free to open up your microphone because um, I'm just going to keep showing you different techniques and until you've got enough techniques to get you started. Carla's saying, hi, Tim, David and I have another meeting we need to attend. Thanks so much for the PD, much appreciated. No, no worries, that's fine. We um, we are recording this, you can always come back to it. At least you know where to find those tutorials. Thanks for joining us. All right, let's, uh, let's do something like, let's create a title. Let's do it like a lower third text title. Uh, which is an often something that we need to do. And um, if you're happy to open up your camera, it would be nice because it's always nice to actually see the people that I'm working with rather than just you hidden away there. Uh, so if you can, that'd be lovely. Thank you, Abigail, for doing that. Um, to do a title, there's some really simple ways and there's also some really cool, not so simple ways of doing it. We're trying to make it as easier as possible. I'll show you a very basic way of getting a title in really quickly. And that's to go to your toolbar. And right down the bottom of your toolbar is the T, type tool. And by clicking the T or the type tool and activating it, you can then go up to your program monitor and just click. Let's try that again. T and Click, there we go. And when you click once, you can then start typing. And my daughter's name is Talana, so I'm just going to bring that in. And instantly you'll notice on your timeline, a graphic has appeared because you've activated the type tool and you've clicked. Just make sure, and I'm gonna do that process again. I'm gonna get rid of that graphic. Just make sure you haven't got anything else selected at the time. So just make sure you're not selecting anything that's on your timeline then it'll work better for you. Hit the type tool and then click once, approximately where you want the, the text to appear. And if you want to manipulate that text and make changes to it, this is where I'm going to introduce you to, uh, it's interesting the way this is. Just bear with me for a second. Yeah, because I started the project 
I'm still trying to get my head around the new way of doing this, trying to find where all my tabs are. And hopefully you've got all your tabs here automatically, but they've disappeared on me. Uh, there's a simple way of getting them back, I do recall. Hmm. If you've got a set of tabs up the top, uh, one of them will say editing. That's the one you should generally always be in, in the editing tab, and that's where you'll get this environment. If you accidentally move to another tab like the um, graphics tab or the audio tab, it, it's a, it does bring a different environment and gets confusing. So just make sure you're always in the editing tab. I've just gone into a section called effect controls which if you're in the editing tab, you'll probably already see it up there, but I have to manually get it myself. So if you can't see the effect controls tab at the top left hand corner, go to window and just click on effect controls and then it'll become available to you. This is a great little tab to be aware of because whenever you've got an element on your timeline, you can manipulate it and control it by going to your effect controls. Now at the moment I've got some text and if I open up the little arrow that sits next to text, it gives me all of these controls. It's a bit like using Photoshop in Premiere Pro. It's like Photoshop for video. And what I might do now is just reduce the size of um, the text. So I'm going to select, select it. I've opened up the text and I'm looking for my options to reduce the scaling. So there's my scale. And if I grab the 100%, or even open up the scale to this slider. It allows me now to reduce the size of it. Or I could have gone into this slider and that'll do the same thing to changing it from 100% down. So I'm just going to bring it right down. I also want to change the font. And so in my underneath my text tool, it's by default, it's gone to Mini on Pro. I'm going to scroll up and find the fonts that I'm supposed to use whenever I'm doing something for Adobe. We've got a series of fonts. Now, if I can't find it straight away, I'm just going to do a search for it by typing in the, the name of the font that I want to work with, and then I'll find it and then change the font, and then I can change the style as well, make it a bit smaller again, and then grab my selection tool and just reposition it so it's where I want it to be. And if I've got a light text with a light background, I'm going to make sure that I've also clicked on either the, the, the stroke and the stroke color can be like a dark color. So it helps it to stand out a little bit more on a white background. Or I could change the color of the text if I wanted to, make it a little bit darker, but I don't want to in this case. I can add in a background and I can even make that background a little bit bigger and less opaque just to make it make the text pop out a little bit more. Put in some curved corners on that background. Or I can add in a drop shadow and not have the background. And then I can control how much of that should be a drop shadow and how much of that should be opaque. There's so much control. It's, it's pretty much unlimited in what you can produce. So I've got that little text there. I'm gonna make it appear just on top of the chair. So when she starts to talk. According to the World Health Organization, most- So it, it appears there and I could have some more information, have her full name, her title or whatever it is. But I'm not happy with the fact that it's just appeared suddenly. Health Organization, most health- I'd like it to fade in. I'd like to add a transition so that it just comes in gradually rather than suddenly appears. And Abigail, if you wouldn't mind keeping an eye on the chat in case there's some questions that come in. Just notice that Janet's saying we've got limited internet, so we'll leave camera off. Yeah, okay. I've got a question myself. Yep. I've lost the beginning of my text and I can't seem to get it back. You've lost I it. Ah, uh, no, it's justified. Yeah, the big, I wrote in title test and the T has disappeared. Okay. So I don't know what um, it's showing. To, yeah. 
I'm trying to know. recreate uh, potentially what's happened to you. Um, so your alignment Just, is to the left, is it? Yeah, the alignment's okay. It's top align, left align. But maybe maybe do it again. Maybe delete yeah, it. Yeah, um, yeah, that might be the easiest yeah. <laughs> solution. <laughs> Hopefully, that's not a common issue. Um, all right, so we've got the title there, and I want to bring it. I want to fade it in. Now, there's a really quick way of getting a transition in Premiere Pro, and the most common transition is a cross dissolve, is like a, which is the same as a fade in, if you like. If you do a right click at the start of any element, whether it's a bit of footage or a title or a still image, if you do a right click and then apply the default transition, it will automatically bring in a cross dissolve for you. So when I hit play, organization, most see my healthcare associated. Talana has just faded in. And if I go to the end of it, I can do the same apply default transition. Now Infections are preventable through good hand hygiene. And that looks a lot more professional rather than just suddenly appearing. And if I wanted to do a transition, say, between that bit of According and my daughter appearing, I could do a right click, apply default transition. It kind of works. According to but in this case, because I've got that sound bar, color bars, it's not going to be that effective. So I'm going to delete that and only apply my transmission. Organization. Most healthcare associated infections are preventable through good hand hygiene. Now, there's lots of other transitions you can bring in because the, the default transition is just a dissolve, but there are literally thousands of other transitions that you can download and bring in and add to. Um, I don't want to get too technical, but uh, just if you are interested in finding out what they are and how they work, you can go to this little tab here. This little, uh, these two little arrows bring up all the tabs that are available here near where all your um, assets are. And if you're looking for the effects tab, and gosh, mine's not there. It, yours is probably there, but for some reason mine's not there. So if anything's not there, go to window and look for effects and then it will appear for you. In the effects tab, what we've got here is a whole bunch of folders and you can see there's a set of folders here that are based around video transitions. Open up those folders, you can see some subfolders. There's a bunch of dissolves, there's a bunch of uh, some really nice ones here if I go to say the slide and the push. So instead of using a cross dissolve, I might grab the push transition and click hold and drag it so that it comes up right at the start of this organization. Most healthcare. As you can see, it's being pushed from left to right on the screen. So it's organization. Most healthcare association. Which is good, but in this left. So when I click on the little push. I can change the direction now. Instead of by default going west to east, it can go east to west. And now that little transition organization, most healthcare associates will go in that direction instead. As you can see, there's so much that you can potentially do. And again, we've I've only just scratched the surface or maybe 2% of what's possible with Adobe Premiere Pro. But these are the basic things that allow you to have some sort of control so you can then keep building your stories and have more um, a lot of fun with it. Um, this is probably a good time now. There's, there's a bunch of other things I want to show you, but this is probably a good time now to, to pause, give you a chance to play, because so hopefully you are actually working with Premiere Pro as I'm showing you. And uh, maybe you've got some questions that you might want to pose at this point, and then I can help uh, answer those questions. I worked out my issue, Tim, with the font that I had chosen didn't like capital letters. Ah, there you go. So you're good now by changing the font. Good. Well, because we're not getting a lot of response uh, from questions, I might actually throw a few questions myself. And uh, I know, Priscilla, you had some students with you, so you may not be able to um, open up your camera, but open up your microphone and tell us, um, what are your thoughts on Premiere Pro? Is this something that you could persist with and work with, or is this just a little bit too complicated? Um, no, definitely it can work with that. 
I'm really excited to have my kids to work with it. I think I have to break it down a little bit. Um, a few of them have watched what I'm doing at the same time, so they're a little bit distracted, but no, it looks really, really good. Good. Nice. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, let's hear from Rob. How are you going, Rob? Yeah, I'm going well. Um, I'm having a few problems with my toolbars disappearing and moving around. I've undocked some stuff and trying to redock them, and I'm struggling a bit with that. But uh, so, Rob, let me give you a quick shortcut because that's a common problem, and I uh, generally at this stage of the workshop, it's something that I will address. So, thank you for bringing that up. It's a good segue. I'm going to makeshift uh, a similar situation where all of a sudden my windows are looking really weird and they're all out of place and it's just not looking right and I'm starting to panic because um, often kids will just be mucking around with the environment and suddenly it doesn't look anything like a usable environment. So if that ever happens, there's a very simple shortcut and that's to go up to your window drop down menu and go to your workspaces. Oh, I saw. I'm in my learning mode. That's why. That's why I couldn't find the tabs. I'm going to go into editing mode in a minute. But um, whatever tab you're in, and then you can go to this button here called Reset to Saved Layout, and that brings everything back to where it should be without you needing to manually do it. So now that I know why I was having that issue, I was going to get rid of that panel. I'm going to jump back to my editing mode, which is where you should be most of the time. You've got these kind of modes or workspaces and editing is where you should be most of the time. So again, if we muck up our environment somehow just by moving things without realizing or it's just not looking right, we go to our workspaces and we choose reset to save layout and within a couple of seconds, everything falls back into place again for you. Let's hear from Jeanette. How are you going, Jeanette? Hi, um, I'm, I'm Janet. But oh, I Janet. presume you mean me. Yep. <laughs> Uh, look, oh, I'm in a bit of an unusual context in that um, I don't actually have Premiere Pro open on my laptop. I'm travelling in a remote area, so I'm just doing my best to have the sound keep going. Um, and I'm, I'm taking copious notes, but I'm actually looking forward to doing a project with teachers where um, I'm recording and um, uh, what they're doing in the classroom and having them and interviewing them and using their voiceovers to explain what they're doing. So uh, I'll definitely keep going with Premiere Pro. Yeah, it's so much more versatile for you. It'll do anything that you want, it'll do. Um, but Premiere Rush will also do that for you because you do have four layers of audio and four layers of video, and it's a much simpler environment. So if if you find Premiere Pro just too daunting, I highly recommend Premiere Rush for you for, for something like that. You'll get, probably have more success. And you can do it all on your phone, <laughs> which you can't do in Premiere Pro. Thanks, Janet. Can I just can I just ask a question? I mean, yep. you you're very positive about Rush, um, and you keep mentioning how daunting Premiere Pro could be. Yep. Um, yep. Is that because people start and then they give up, or because you 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 really think that we should have done Rush first and then worked our way up to Premiere Pro? Yeah, usual workflow when, when we're teaching video production in in the Adobe world is to start with with Adobe Express Video. It's a very basic video storytelling tool. It's free for all schools. So that's a very simple way of just teaching the structure of how to tell a video story. Then move to Rush. Normally we start moving to Rush at around about grade five. Uh, Adobe Express is usually sort of lower to mid primary school and then maybe into early secondary. But Rush is upper primary, early secondary. And then when they get to about year nine, and I'm generalizing here, uh, they start to get really frustrated with the limitations of Rush. And that's when we start moving into Premiere Pro. Uh, but again, I'm generalizing because as I said at the start of the session, I know primary school students in grade five who are using Premiere Pro for their YouTube channels because they want to. And that's fine. There's, you shouldn't sort of limit uh, people to just their ages. 
But again, a lot's to do with availability and Premier Rush and Adobe Express are free for all K-12 schools around the world, whereas Premier Pro is not. It's part of the creative cloud. Uh, so you may you may find there's less access to Premier Pro as well. Tim, I might just jump in there. Um, from my experience, I find that most of the things that I want to do, if I'm doing them in Premier Pro, I probably could have done them in Premier Rush anyway. However, if if you're looking at it and it all looks like you can it all looks like it makes sense um then i would say stick with premier pro because then you've got opportunity to expand and discover um and it's not limited but that's just my my opinion yeah no i i totally agree with you with that but the good thing is you've got options I've just worked out where to find those tabs. Show workspace labels, editing. I'm still getting used to the new version. Preset to save layout. Is it going to fix it? So I'm used to having the tabs up here at the top, and it's worrying me that I haven't uh, show workspace tabs. Here we go. That's what I want. And in the older version, they're always there. In the newer version, it looks like you can hide them. So it's worth going through these tabs. The editing tab, as I mentioned, is where you should always be. But if you're at the stage where you've just about finished and you want to do some color correction, you can move into the color tab, and then you've got all of your color correction tools that are available to you. I want to show you a really cool one. Notice how um, it's a little bit bland uh, with my <laughs> footage here with Tolano compared to say the footage here from Central America that looks just beautiful because it was done with a professional camera this was done with a fairly basic Canon camera but I could enhance that a little bit more so what I'd love to do in the color mode I've now got this tool here but the great thing about this tool is one button I don't need to know much about it I'm just trying to find oh, I've got a basic correction here we go so I'm jumping into basic correction and then this auto button. When you click auto, all these elements start to change automatically for you. And if they're not, if you're not happy with them, you can start moving them around until you get a little bit more. I mean, she's, she, her skin tones are coming out a lot better now and maybe change the exposure slightly. So you can manually control your colors or you can just hit that auto button and it'll automatically do it for you with a bit of artificial intelligence. So that's quite quite handy to know about. And I'll show you another little technique here. So I've got... Organisation, most healthcare associated infections are preventable through good hand hygiene. Now, what I might do is um, I might bring in an audio track at this point here. So if I go to my audio folder, I've got a couple of audio tracks and I know you haven't got this footage, um, but if you've got any music at all, you can just go and download it. Remember, you can do a right click, import, bring that music in. But I, I'd always recommend that you have that music in your project folder initially and then import it from there. Uh, but just for the sake of this tutorial, feel free to just grab any music at all. I'm going to grab uh, this bit of footage, this bit of audio here and hit play. And the way we bring in music or audio or soundtracks into our audio layers, noting that in our timeline, we've got at the moment three layers of audio and three layers of video that are visible. If I wanted to create more layers, I'd just do a right click above the, um, the final layer there and go add tracks and then click OK and that would add a fourth layer of video and a fourth layer of audio. And as I said earlier, you can have up to 96 layers, which no one ever needs. And you'd probably want this massive monitor if you're gonna have more than even 10 or 20 layers. So I've got plenty of layers to work with. So I'm gonna grab this bit of footage and just in the center below the sample of the footage are two buttons that are worth noting. This one's drag video only. So if there was video here, I could just drag the video and not have the audio. In this case, it's just audio, so that's why that's that's hidden. And I can just drag the audio, because what I can't do with audio is go in, out, drag, 
because there's nothing to in out and drag really. There's, there's no footage there to drag in. So I'm going to grab that little drag audio only button and then drag my whole soundtrack and I'm going to make it come in when my daughter starts to talk. According to the World Health, the, f the uh, music's going to appear as well. Organisation, most healthcare associated infections are preventable through good. So I'll just do those steps again. I've found my audio track and if I wanted to, I could set up an in and out point, but I want to bring the whole soundtrack in. So I'm just going to grab that little drag audio only button, click and drag it, bring in that soundtrack at exactly the point where I want it to appear. According to the World Health Organization, most healthcare associated... Now the problem that I've got is that the music's probably a little bit too loud. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to manually control the volume levels of, of your audio. Um, I'm going to jump back into editing mode to do this. So I'm, get, I'm still in color correction mode, so I'm going to go back into editing mode. And with my audio... I'm going to take my cursor over to this section here between the microphone symbol and the beginning of this layer. There's a bit of black. If I double click that bit of black, it opens up the layer. And when you open up a layer, you can see a lot more. In fact, you can see this white line. This white line represents the volume. And I could just grab that white line and drag it down. So I'm dragging the whole volume down. And that's fine. That might be exactly what I want. In fact, I'm going to do that to see what that's going to be like now and listen to it. According to the World Health... A little bit too soft, so I'm going to bring it up a little bit. According to the World Health... Maybe down just a fraction. Organisation, most healthcare associated infections... Are I'll bring it down just a little bit more because what I want to do is as soon as she stops talking and we can just see this image here, I would like to bring up the volume at that point. So to do that, we need to apply what's called keyframes so we can have a total control over every little element. To do that, we're going to go to the toolbar and click on the little pen tool, activate the pen tool and set up a keyframe just as she starts to stop talking. So about here, you can see a little, a little dot that's appeared in my timeline on the white line. And then another keyframe just after she stops talking. And then that second keyframe, I'm going to click and drag up so that we've got the volume increasing gradually as she stops talking. And let's just have a listen to it. ...are preventable through good hand hygiene. And then I'm going to do another keyframe and another one and then drag it back down again because I want her to start talking again at this point. So you can see how much control you've got with your audio. Every little keyframe allows you to change different elements, and it's just it's just a beautiful tool to work with once you get the hang of it. Any questions at this point? Mike, I didn't uh, get a chance to ask you how you're traveling. How are you going, Mike? Mike, Mike has probably disappeared. Mike, do you have a mic? Here we go. Haven't had a go yet. No worries. <laughs> okay, good on your mic. Um, all right. So let's um, let's uh, reapply some of the things that we've already been learning. So I want to find some more footage of it. So I'm going to go back to my my files. A nice way of managing, rather than having these chunky folders here, is to go right down to the bottom left hand corner and move from icon view to list view. By doing that, we can manage our footage and manage our audio a lot better. Um, but by doing that, I've lost my preview as well as what they look like. So I'm going to open up that footage bin. And just by opening it up, it becomes a separate tab. And now I can see all the footage that's in there. It's going to find where she's talking again. So. So just before she says so, that's where I'm going to set up an in point. So you should wash your hands regularly and always after going to the toilet and before you eat. I'm going to set up an out point and then drag that in so that it appears at exactly the point where I want it to appear. Good hand hygiene. 
What I'm thinking is I might make this picture full screen because it looks a bit silly just being up there and then have it in the middle. Through good hand hygiene. And get rid of Talana a little bit quicker. Infections are preventable through good hand hygiene. So you should wash your hands. Now, of course, the resolution's out. So again, I just do a right click on it and go looking for that little image, that little a button scale to frame size that brings her back to the right. So you should wash your hands regularly and always. I might transition that picture out. So go apply default transition so that it fades out. And let's see. So you should wash your hands regularly. The fade was a bit slow. I'm going to zoom right in on that transition and reduce the length of it. Make it go and that'll make the tree. So you should wash your hands regularly and always after going to the toilet and before you eat. And that's looking, that's starting to take shape. Starting to... So you should wash your hands regularly. Now notice how I've lost the colour correction because I brought in this new bit of footage. I want to show you a nice little technique that allows you to copy and paste. I've got much better colour correction in this version. So I'm going to do a right click on the original bit of footage of my daughter and copy it. I'm now going to go to the new bit of footage of my daughter and go to paste attributes. And when I go paste attributes, it's going to ask me which of the attributes of the original bit of footage do you want to paste? And I want the color correction. Um, virtually everything else is I want as well. So I'm going to keep that all ticked, but I can untick anything that I don't want. Click OK. And now we've got a consistent color correction happening across both. So it saves me going through that whole process a second time. So she's got nice skin tones. Good hand hygiene. And she's got you should wash your hands. skin tones here, exactly the same colour correction. So that was copying the one that you've already spent time on by right-click copy and then right-click paste attributes and then selecting the attributes you want to paste. And that is a real time saver. You should wash your hands regularly and always after going to the toilet and before you eat. All right, how are we going? We've only got 20 minutes left, so I'll just do another maybe 10 minutes of um, sharing some things uh, and then share some more resources for you to go on with. Do we have any questions, any comments, or is there anything you really want me to show you? Uh, obviously, I haven't shown you how to export. That's a fundamental thing that I'll show you soon but there's like a hundred things I could show you. Is there anything that really stands out that you want to know about Premiere Pro uh, before we finish up? Uh, I'd like to ask a question about green screen. Yeah. I'm likely to use that. Is okay. that something you could, <laughs> I could manage to explain a bit? I'm happy to, but it'll be very much a, a very fast paced demo because um, uh, it's, it's, it's a quite a few processes involved, but because we are recording this, you can always go back and just watch the recording of that segment. So let's do some green screening. What I've got here in some footage is a little character animator character. This is Chloe and she's saying. The best way to keep yourself and others healthy is to keep your hands clean. Well, it's a very quick, rough little character animator export. I'm gonna bring that into my footage. Just drag the whole thing in. Way to keep and notice the resolution needs to be fixed. So right click, scale to frame size. Now that I've got um, a green screen, effectively, I've got Chloe with a green. It could be a, a student that you're filming with a green bit of cloth. Do you know, I just use green cloth from Lincraft. Uh, I used to I used to actually have, a, when I was a school teacher, a full infinity wall green screen TV studio at my school that I built when we had a new art center designed and I was so lucky to have that. We spent thousands and thousands of dollars on it where now I just carry a little bit of green cloth and the quality is no different between when I carry that bit of green cloth and use that here in my home studio compared to what I had at the school. So green cloths are fantastic. It doesn't even have to be green. It just has to be a color that's not already existing in your skin tone or whatever you're wearing uh, because we can always key out any color. First step we want to do is we want to work out what the background is going to be. So I'm going to choose, I'm just going to choose another bit of footage here. Maybe I'll just grab that bit of footage. So that, that'll become my background. 
So what I want to do now is I want to bring the green screen up a layer and bring my background behind it, but I don't want to bring the audio there. So I'm going to use this magic button that I talked about before, drag video only, and I'm going to drag just the video behind. So we've got two layers. We've got Chloe okay. talking above and below that will be the background. If I hide that top layer, you can see the backgrounds there. It's out of proportion. So I'm going to right click, scale the frame size and just bring Chloe back. So we know we've got our two layers. What I want to do now is I want to crop out as much of the green as possible before I add what's called a chroma key filter to it. Often you find that when you're filming in a school classroom environment, you don't get a perfect green background. You get all different shades of green and the, the rubbish bin might be in shot as well or a whiteboard might be there. So you want to crop out as much of the green as possible. So you're only keying out what you have to key out, allowing room for the talent to move. So I'm going to allow room. Let's say Chloe's arm is going to move up to about here. So I'm going to crop up to about this point, crop out to this point. To do some cropping, I'm going to go to my effects tab that I showed you earlier to get your transitions. And I can't remember exactly where to find the cropping effect. So we've got this lovely search engine where it's got a little magnifying glass. I'm going to type in the word crop. And that tells me where my cropping filter is. It's in a folder called video effects and a folder called transform. Now that I've found my cropping filter, I'm going to click and drag it on top of the green screen footage and then go to my effect controls tab. And I should have a whole list of tools under the heading of crop. So I can now open up my crop to the left, crop a little bit of the top, crop a bit of the bottom, and most importantly here, crop to the right. So I'm getting rid of all the extra green that I don't need. Now that I've done my cropping, I can apply the chroma key filter and the filter that we use in Premiere Pro is the most commonly used chroma key filter in the world. It's called the Ultra Key, U-L-T-R-A, Ultra Key, two different words. So I'm going to go with searching. I'm going to stop my searching for crop and do a search for ultra. The Ultra Key filter is found in my keying folder. There's lots of other filters you could use, but the Ultra Key is the best one. So just stick with that one and you'll get a good job just about every time. I'm going to grab that Ultra Key filter, drag it on top of my green screen. And now in my effect controls, I've got a whole lot of controls under the heading of Ultra Key. The most important one is this little droplet tool. And that's what I select. And as soon as I select the green, it should disappear. There we go. Because I've selected out that key. Now, because it's a perfect green, because it was done with an animation, it's done a perfect job. But as I said earlier in a classroom, you're never going to get a perfect green, no matter how well lit the classroom is. So what you might want to start doing is working with these different settings, the matte generation and the ped pedestal tool. You open that right up to 100%. That usually gets rid of all your imperfections and then you've got a perfect key. If it's not perfect, keep playing with all the other options that are here until you've got yourself a perfect key and you cannot see any of the green anymore. And once you've done that, you can then grab your talent. In this case, I've got Chloe and just reposition that talent anywhere on the screen that you want it to go because it's a separate layer. The best way to keep yourself and others healthy and that's so much fun. I haven't got a good background there, so I'm going to go and find some more footage to bring in. Let's grab some of the <laughs> some of the uh, the uh, Central American footage. Put that in the background as well, just for a bit of fun. <laughs> just get rid of the fake. That kind of works, doesn't it? That's because they're keeping themselves healthy. And no matter what I put in the background, it could be a still image. Images. I've done myself my chroma key and I've got my different layers. Janet, how was that? Was that helpful? That was fantastic. Yeah, really good. Thanks <laughs> a lot. Go, didn't go too fast for you, did I? Well, no, 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 you didn't. I mean, it's um, sure the the controls and the the choices are different, but I mean, the, the whole concept of the green screen is pretty much uh, the same as in iMovie. 
um, I really appreciated learning about that, uh, cutting the green out. I mean, yeah. yeah, that's a good tip. Look forward to playing with it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. That was great. And there's lots of tutorials. You do a search on YouTube for chroma keying or green screening or ultra key. Uh, there'll be a 15 year old American boy who will teach you what to do. I don't know what it is about 15 year old American boys on YouTube, but uh, if you can't find the right one through the Adobe tutorials, there's always going to be other people that can help you. On that. Um, I need to show you how to export, which I'll do in a sec. Something else just quickly came to mind that could be important. Oh, yeah, doing a, a nice motion graphic template. These are really cool. If I go up to my tabs again and move to my captions and graphics tab, this is worth noting. On the right hand side, I've got a whole series of motion graphic templates that are built in that I can just drag into my footage. So if I want to grab this this one here and just drag it in, it'll superimpose over the top and becomes a nice graphic that I can just double click and change. I'll just change it to Chloe. Change the tagline to keep healthy. And that's a lovely little graphic that I've just brought in. Mm -hmm. It's been created with Adobe After Effects, but you don't need to know anything about After Effects to use it. Just like in Rush, you've got a whole lot of motion graphic templates that you can work with Premiere Rush that you just drag in. Same concept, but a lot more controls. And the other thing I wanted to show you too is there's a fantastic tool here called Transcribe Sequence Create New Caption Track. It automatically adds closed captioning for you. It's so cool and it does it all with artificial intelligence. I'm not sure, I might just see, because there's not a lot of dialogue here. Um, let's see if we'll do it quickly, create new caption. Kim, can you um, export that caption file as a separate file as you well? Can. Yeah, as Perfect. You can. yeah, all of that is, is possible. Um, is that working? No, I'm not sure what's going on. Normally it's just that one click and then it creates, maybe it's thinking about it. No, I must be having a little issue, but what normally happens, it started to create an extra layer on your timeline. And I'm going to undo and see, create new, import captions, create, transcribe. Ah, so if I click transcribe sequence first, and then transcribe, it's now going to start thinking about all the dialogue and transcribe it, and then I could export it out as an individual text file. Um, I think you can even export it out as a Word document as well if you wanted to. It's taking a few minutes now, but it, I know it's working because I can see it's working, and it's thinking about everything that my daughter's been saying, and it's converting it to text. And once that blue line has gone all the way across, it will create a new layer for us. Uh, it'll, it'll ask you to check first, is it, is it all good? And it seems to be all good. One little tip is I don't check it at this point. I tend to click create captions so that I know that I've got it in my timeline and then I check it because I can always make changes to it. But sometimes, what's happening? Uh, I'm getting another window somewhere on one of my many screens. Create captions. Uh, where is it gone? It's probably hidden away under Microsoft Teams somewhere. Oh, here it is. It's hidden right down the bottom corner of one of my screens. There we go. And we click Create. And now it's creating the captions. There we go. So let's see how accurate this has been. I'll take it from here. According to the World Health Organization, most healthcare-associated infections are preventable through good hand hygiene. How does this work? That's all my good. So, you should wash your hands regularly and always after going to the toilet and before you eat. Yeah, there's half a minute. Best way to keep yourself and others healthy. <laughs> Obama is healthy. Your there you go. I'm going to change that from Obama <laughs> to, uh, and then you can just go ahead and yourself and change the typing. Anyway, you, you get the idea. And it's created its own little layer, and um, you can change the timing and change the fonts and styles. and and it automatically captions everything for you. So let's say you've you've finished and you're happy with it. Um, I'm going to export. One of the things with exporting is it's good to set up an in point and an out point in your timeline because you may have forgotten that you had all these stray clips 
out here somewhere that you've totally forgotten about. And if you don't set up an out point, it will export everything on your timeline. You'll end up exporting all this black and wasting your time, wasting your hard drive and so on. So what I'm going to do, is I'm actually going to get rid of all of these extra. I don't need any of those clips. Now that I've got rid of those, if I do a right click where there's a big gap and it says ripple delete, it'll bring everything into that gap and just everything sort of moves for you. It's a bit different to Rush where everything automatically ripple deletes in Rush, kind of saves you that because as a professional tool, um, we haven't got that feature. You have to manually ripple delete. So we've got this. According to the World Health. And I'm just going to finish it off with. Clean. I might just fade out the music at this point, fade it up and fade it out. So I need to go back to my editing mode, find my little pen tool, bring the music up, and then bring it down. and trim my closed captions. I don't need the word clean there for that long. And trim my music as well. OK, so that's going to be the out point. O for out. It automatically has an, has an in point at the start, so I'll just bring one in manually anyway. And then we're going up to the export options up the top. This is uh, one way of doing it, just clicking export, and then you can see a whole range of uh, ways of doing this. You can export it to YouTube, to Vimeo, to Twitter, all your social media is sitting there. But by default, you'll be exporting it as an MP4 file. You can change that as well. You can change your format to various formats. Can I recommend you generally always go with H.264 as your codec, because then it'll be read by just about every media player on the planet. And you shouldn't have any problems with people reading your video. Give it a name, I'll call it wash hands decide where you want to put it usually back into your project folder that we talked about right at the very start of the session so i'm going to find my project folder click choose and there's lots of other settings you could go into if you wanted to but that's they're the basic ones you need to worry about go down to the bottom right hand corner and click export and then just wait for it to render and build itself into an actual video that didn't take too long at all. So let's see what uh, I've got. If I go to my most washing hands, and there it is. That was done today at 5.23. So I open that up with QuickTime, which is the media player I tend to use. I ended up exporting that fairly low res, but I could have exported that in full high def. Um, I won't get into too much uh, complications, but if you if you if you're exporting at 720, which is standard high def, that's fine. It's perfectly fine for a big screen in a classroom. If you're exporting something for an assembly and you know you want it on a massive screen in your school assembly hall, then make sure you're you're starting off and doing everything in full high def or even in 4K if you're able to. You'll get the best possible quality that way. I don't recommend 4K just because it chews up so much of your your processing power and your hard drive. But 720 is fine, 1080. What I tend to do these days is I film in 1080, full high def, and I edit down to 720. And that allows me some extra space to do some extra zooming or some extra panning that I may have forgotten to do when I was filming initially. And that's what professional editors do. In fact, David Fincher, one of Hollywood's greatest filmmakers, uh, when he did his film Gone Girl with Ben Affleck, he did it all with Premiere Pro. He filmed in 8K because that was the best technology they had at the time. He edited down to 4K for cinema, and they actually did do extra zooming, extra panning, and didn't lose any quality by doing that because he had these extra pixels to play with that the, the uh, cinematographer didn't actually do when they, were, when they were actually filming. And he talks about it. We had him out at an Adobe Max conference to talk about how he did exactly that when he produced his film Gone Girl. It was the first ever Hollywood blockbuster film that was made with Adobe Premiere Pro. And since then, there's been hundreds of them. And uh, I'm trying to think of the most recent one. Uh, Tim Miller, who did Deadpool, also did the latest um, Terminator film, all with Adobe Premiere Pro. And of course, we had him out for Adobe Max to talk about that as well. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing.
Uh, so here's my finished. According to the World Health Organization, most healthcare associated infections, which you've seen before, it is actually a video file now rather than a Premier Pro project. All right, we need to wrap things up. So let me just give you a few resources. Uh, we've got a summit coming up, and Premier Pro is actually going to be one of the workshop options at the summit. If you're keen, there's going to be lots of other options too. In fact, I've got about 20 workshop options available for every session at this stage, maybe 15 to 20 once we've refined them. Uh, if you go to that link, and I'll just put that into the chat for you, and I'll add an HTTPS colon slash slash so it becomes a live link. Hopefully that's a live link. It doesn't look live, maybe it is. But that, that's how you can register for our summit. It's during the school holidays and uh, I encourage you all to uh, be part of it. We'll have hopefully about a thousand teachers joining us online. I've got 30 presenters who are, are flying into Sydney to present from our Sydney office, and it's going to be a fantastic event. If you ever want to get involved in any of our other free webinars and face-to-face -face events that we run, we don't do too many in South Australia, so most of them will be uh, webinars. This is a great link to also have access to, so I'll bring that into the chat for you. HTTPS colon slash slash. And that should be a live link now for you. And what else have I got with three minutes to go? I won't play this clip, but I will give you the link to it so you can have a look at some more resources that we've got. That's not a live link, so you might need to copy and paste that into a browser. But finally, because we've only got a couple minutes left, there's the QR code to our contact form. If you don't already get my newsletter, and I do a newsletter once a month, the August edition came out yesterday. So if you didn't get an email from Adobe with my newsletter, I recommend you join the email list so that you can keep up to date with the world of Adobe in education. Our next session, Abigail, is on September the 13th. It's on Adobe Illustrator with Steve Nichols. And then on October 20, we're doing Acrobat with Brian Chow. And uh, I'll leave it there, Abigail, I'll leave it to you to uh, finish up. And I'm happy to hang around if anyone's got some extra questions. Thank you again, Tim, for another very uh, useful session. Um, I see that some people have commented that those extra bits of information you give us that you might not get through um, just watching in YouTube about the best format, et cetera. They're really, really useful for us that might not be as confident as you around video editing. So thank you very, very much. And we look forward to the next session. Thank you also to those that have joined us live. It does um, help when we've got some interaction and some questions from those that have joined us live as well. So thank you, Tim, and I will stop the recording. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening.